Do bastard swords make rubbish one-handed swords? Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator. So recently I did a review of this Hanway Rhinelander and in it I mentioned that at a push, I just put the buckler down, at a push you could use this as a one-handed sword. And that's true, you, you kind of can. It doesn't handle particularly well as a one-handed sword, but you could absolutely use it in one hand. And something we have to recognise is that a lot of long swords, or uh, bastard swords, hand and a half swords, whatever you want to call them, and obviously some people prefer to use those different terms for different types of long sword, um, were used in one hand and needed sometimes to be used in one hand. And uh, probably the most common example of when you're going to use a sword like this in one hand is on horseback. Now, on horseback, technically, you can just drop the reins, or there's some references to putting the reins in the teeth and gripping them in your teeth, uh, and you can use a two-handed weapon. Now obviously, famously, two-handed weapons were sometimes used from horseback. I um, had a little bit of back and forth with Jason Kingsley about this, you may remember a few months ago in uh, regards to the game Bannerlord, and one of my bugs, <laughs> one of my massive bugbears actually with Bannerlord, and I play quite a lot of Bannerlord, um, but one of my massive bugbears is the way that two-handed weapons are treated on horseback. Uh, number one, because the person riding the horse doesn't seem to suffer any penalties to riding their horse, by using a two-handed weapon, which in reality you would uh, because of the way that you're twisting and moving and shifting your balance, which is giving false information to the horse and the fact that um, you're not holding the reins of the horse. Um, so yes, indeed, there are people who train to ride just with their legs and without holding reins. There are obviously mounted archers, although archeries are far more less movement based or less sort of energetic um, activity to be doing from horseback than swinging a glaive around. But uh, the second major bugbear I have with it is that um, in Bannerlord, the use of, for example, a glaive or a menavillion, any type of polearm uh, used for cutting from a horse, very much is constrained by the fact that you're sitting on a horse. You've got the horse's head, you've got the horse's flank, you've obviously got everything that's between your legs and you're sitting like this, so your, your body movement is somewhat limited. So when you're swinging a, a weapon, there are only certain angles that you can do it from and only certain ranges of motion you can get. Jason Kingsley nicely showed riding along and just donking a target without really moving the polax through a big range of motions. There are certain angles you can do where it's not going to interfere with the horse, absolutely. Um, but the point is, and bringing it back to uh, these swords, predominantly when two-handed swords were used on horseback, uh, if they had to be used on horseback, then they were used as one-handed swords. And that is one of the absolute main reasons why these swords were popular, because on foot you could use them as a two-handed sword, and on horseback, you could use them as a one-handed sword, okay? So that's one of the reasons that really big long swords were probably not as common as these sorts of size long swords, because these can be used one-handed or two-handed, so they're very versatile, so therefore they're very practical weapons on the battlefield. Something like the uh, massive Kvitan Zweihander here. Um, could I use this on horseback? Absolutely I could. But it wouldn't be a very great weapon to be using on horseback. Yes, I can hold it in one hand, I can swing it in one hand. Kavitan did a fantastic job, as they always do, of making a weapon that's nicely balanced and moves around well. If I was using on this, on, this on horseback, I could swing it, but that probably wouldn't be the best idea. Probably the best idea would simply be to either couch it, like a lance, which we know was done sometimes with two-handed swords, or to use it essentially like a spear, from thrusting from above or below using the motion of the horse. Now, this is the important part. Therefore, when we're looking at a longsword or a bastard sword, it doesn't have to be fantastically nimble in one hand if the main reason for using it in one hand is fighting on horseback. Because for fighting on horseback, you don't need a sword to be as nimble as a sword that you're fighting on foot with and fencing with, because a lot of the energy of the blow or thrust is, is delivered by the horse. It's not from your arm or your body. So if we're riding along at full canter and we've got our sword ready and we see an opponent there, we're going to thrust at them, what do we do? We don't, we don't, ha-ha! We don't do a lunge like that. In fact, that is expressly 
advised against in 19th century cavalry um, uh, sort of training uh, and advice and manuals. In fact, what you do is you let your horse carry on moving at whatever speed it's moving, 20 miles an hour, 30 miles an hour, and you hold the point out and you deliver the point. You aim and you let the horse do the movement. As you enter the target, you carry on moving through it and you let the sword extract out and pull it through as you, as you go through. If you're delivering a cut, exactly the same thing. You're riding your horse. Your horse is providing the momentum. You don't need to do a massive swing. In fact, it could be detrimental. You might hit your own horse. You might unbalance yourself out of the saddle or whatever. It's actually far better to simply present the edge. Yeah, you could do a bit of a motion with it, uh, but to present the edge at the target and let the motion of the horse carry you through the target then slide across the target and then disengage out as you go past. So on horseback, the momentum and energy for your weapon is provided by the horse, not by the swordsman's arm per se, not for the most part. So quite simply, you can have a long sword or a two-handed sword that is fairly big and beefy and not very good as a one-handed sword on foot, but it's good enough as a one-handed sword on horseback. And just to bring it to the 19th century for a second, although we're primarily looking at medieval and renaissance swords here, if we look at cavalry swords, so I've got two behind me, I've got a French and an Austrian cavalry sword. This Austrian cavalry sword is lovely. I absolutely love it, I think it's the 1861 pattern. And it is a big beefy chopper, but it is a cavalry sword. Now, if I was fighting someone on foot, Depending on the circumstances, this wouldn't be a sword that I would choose. But on horseback, this is a massive, powerful sword that can give very powerful blows, but also is very strong and robust at just impacting targets using the momentum of the horse. So a very, very powerful sword, but not a very nimble sword, because it doesn't need to be for fighting on horseback. It wouldn't be very appropriate uh, for fighting on foot. Now, what you actually find is... In the 19th century, you get some swords that are big, massive cavalry swords. You get some swords that are really quite light and nimble infantry officers' swords. And you get some swords, in fact, probably most swords, that are somewhere in between because they recognise that lots of swords have to fulfil both functions. And indeed, not all of their soldiers could necessarily handle a really big cavalry sword. So, for example, in Britain, the household cavalry have really big swords but they also are recruited from the biggest, strongest men and mounted on the biggest, strongest horses. The majority of the cavalry actually used lighter swords and shorter swords that were more similar, actually, to the weight, at least, a little bit of a difference, but more similar to the weight of an infantry officer's sword. Um, so there is a spectrum there. But coming back to long swords, the simple fact is that most long swords don't make fantastic one-handed swords for a number of reasons. Number one, because they're primarily designed to be used two-handed. Okay, that's the first thing. The second, the second reason is that um, you've got an extent of hilt out here. Now there are some one-handed swords which have an extent of hilt out the back. The Langmesser, for example, the Dar, the Burmese Dar, the Wakasashi, and the Katana. Um, so there are other swords where you have an extension out of the back, but they don't usually have metallic pommels at the end. When you've got an extension of grip sticking out the back with a metallic pommel, it does mean that you, your rotational inertia is not fantastic for a one-handed sword. If you look at most dedicated one-handed swords, certainly in Europe, they have very short grips, whether it's a side sword or an arming sword or a Viking era sword, whatever. They tend to have short grips and the pommel's very close to the hand so that, there, so that there's no back end rotational uh, inertia working against what you're trying to do with hitting the target. Um, also, this can get in the way as well. When you're manipulating, for example, if we're doing sword and buckler, if you've got a hilt sticking out the back of your sword, it can get in the way of your own, your other arm, uh, it can get in the way of your clothes and things like that, it can get in the way of shields and bucklers. Admittedly, it can also be used to hook and to pommel and other sorts of things as well. So you do get some benefits potentially, but overall, for a one handed sword, a long grip isn't particularly desirable, um, certainly if you've got a pommel on the end. Right, so generally speaking, uh, also, we've got size and weight. Okay, so because these are made for two-handed use, uh, they, generally speaking, are, tend to be a little bit too long, a little bit too heavy for one-handed use, but that's not always the case. 
There are many long swords actually surviving which have shorter blades than some one-handed swords. So that's not necessarily a major factor, but, but in the case of many long swords, if you look at the total mass of most long swords, if you look on, for example, the Albion website, and you look at the long sword weights, and then you look at the one-handed sword weights, it's not always true. You do get light long swords and you do get heavy one hand swords, but generally speaking, if we plotted them on a graph, you'd see that the, 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 the mean of the long swords is higher up the, the, the mass uh, scale than the mean of the arming swords. So they tend to be uh, a bit bigger, they tend to be a bit heavier, they tend to be a bit bigger proportion around the hilt and have more of an extension at the back. So they tend not to make as good one handed swords. As a one-handed sword, surprise, surprise, because of course, and this is the headline, if the best shape for a one-handed sword was this, then this is what one-handed swords would look like. And the fact that one-handed swords don't look like long swords shows you that that's the best shape for a one-handed sword. The fact that one-handed swords are a different thing shows you that those are optimum for one-handed swords. But just to um, finish off, Bucklers and shields. The fact is that whilst the main reason for these uh, being usable still in one hand and, and that being a desirable thing and not just making them into massive two-handed swords, um, it's desirable for riding but it's also desirable for the use of off-hand things. Um, and in fact if we look at Paulus Cowell's treatise uh, from the late 15th century, then in fact we can see actually sword and buckler being done with bastard swords. Um, so it was done, definitely. And you know, if a bastard sword is what you've got, you want to hedge your bets, you want to use it as a long sword, you want to use it as a one hand sword, you want to use it on horseback and on foot. So you've got a bastard sword, but you also want to sometimes use a buckler, where then that's what you're going to use. Not everybody had a selection of different swords, not everybody had multiple swords. So if what you have is a bastard sword, you, and, but you want to use a buckler for some reason, that's what you're going to use it with. Is it as good as a one-handed sword with a buckler? Usually, not really. Depends on the bastard sword, depends on the one-handed sword. But generally speaking, a one-handed sword is a better one-handed sword than something that's not a one-handed sword only. Okay, so uh, it was done, but it's not optimal. And indeed, these were also used um, with larger shields like pavises, um, hand pavises, hand shields. Uh, and we see this in uh, Freidal, for example, Maximilian's Freidal. Uh, we can see long swords being used with uh, larger shields, certainly done. So there are many, many reasons. And of course, we get into grabbing and grappling and disarming, uh, climbing ladders, um, all sorts of other, holding a lantern at night, all sorts of other potential reasons why you might want to be able to use your longsword in one-handed sword. But the headline is, a one-handed sword is always a better one-handed sword than a longsword. But longswords are swords that still give you the option to use as a one-handed sword if you really want to or need to. Hope this has been useful and uh, I will see you really soon again on the channel for another video. You're welcome to give me um, ideas for new topics or questions below. I always read the comments. Um, so thanks a lot for comments and I will be waiting for them. And I'll see you for the new video when it comes out. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.